You're listening to Preachers of the Old Paths from Canaan Radio, a ministry of the North Platte Baptist Church. The opinions expressed in the following sermon are the preacher's personal views and do not always reflect those of the North Platte Baptist Church. We ask that you take Acts 17.11 to heart and search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Come to the book of Matthew, chapter 7, please. I'll speak very briefly this morning, share with you some things that are on my heart. I appreciate the introduction. It might be like the fellow who uh, boasted he could whip anybody in his town, and nobody took him up on it. So he boasted he'd whip anybody in his county, and nobody took him up on it. Then he boasted he'd whip anybody in his state, and nobody took him up on it. He boasted he could whip anybody south of the Mason-Dixon line, and nobody took him up on it. Then he boasted he could whip anybody in the United States of America, and some guy beat his block off. And they said, what happened? He said, I took in too much territory. <laughs> now, I get nervous after an introduction like that. Three things are nearly impossible to do. Climb a wall that's leaning towards you. And kiss a girl that's leaning away from you. I've tried both. <laughs> and to preach a sermon after that kind of an introduction. I used to work at fire station number two in DeKalb County. A drunk came in one day and said, Boy, what's your name? I told him. He wrote it on a piece of paper. He went to another guy and said, Boy, what's your name? He told him to wrote it on a piece of paper. He went to the engine driver who was big as the cotton elms back there, and that's big. He said, Boy, what's your name? The engine driver told him. Then the engine driver looked at him and said, What do you want my name for? Well, he said, I'm writing down everybody's name. I'm on a whip. When I get all the names written down, I'm going to whip all of them. That big old engine driver stood up and just kept on getting up. Looked down on that little drunk. Grabbed and shook him real good. Said, I'll have you know right now, you're not going to whip me. He said, I'll just scratch your name off this list. And That really happened. <laughs> After that introduction, I think some of the things he said maybe ought to be scratched off the list. In fact, I'm sure they are. He may have been exaggerating. I heard of a little guy who exaggerated about everything, told lies. He told convincing stories, very convincing stories. He said, I saw this green thing come down out of the air, and pink men got out of it. it had 13 legs, seven on the ground, six up in the air. Had nine eyeballs. He'd tell about seeing these weird animals come out of the forest. And he said it was such a straight face, everybody believed him. And the preacher thought he'd teach him a lesson. So he said, son, sit down, let me tell you a story. He said, I was holding service one time in this little country church. He said it was packed and jammed. You couldn't get any more people in the building. He said, this great big old bear came down out of the mountain. Said it was so big it couldn't get in the door. He got on his all fours and crawled in. So when he got in, he stood up, said his head scraped the ceiling of the building. He said he was a monster. So he began to grab people and just eat them like hamburgers, one at a time. <laughs> Little boys. And he said, son, just before he ate up the whole congregation, said this little fast dog came running from outside, jumped on the bear and threw him down and killed him just like that. The boy said, he said, son, you believe that story? He said, yes, sir, that was my dog. <laughs> Bill Pennell's dog. <laughs> I hope I didn't preach after that introduction. I've been flying all night. I've been in the air more than a seagull with sore feet the last few months. I spoke last night in Rosebud, Arkansas, population 157. What the sign said, I didn't find but seven. A few more than that. And had to drive to Memphis, Tennessee, 
and got there around three this morning, caught a plane out of there shortly after three and flew to Atlanta, and napped a few minutes on the way from Memphis to Atlanta, and then caught a flight there. Was supposed to arrive here at seven eleven, and got here near eight o'clock this morning, and I'm tired. I feel like the man who got up one morning, he couldn't hardly move. And the guy said, why are you so tired? He said, I read last night before I went to bed that the average person turns over 30 times in his sleep. He said, I weigh 200 pounds. <laughs> you realize I lifted three tons last night while I was... <laughs> And I hope as tired as I am, I'll be able to preach with a little power. We had a campaign in Huntington, West Virginia, had a good campaign there. I see some of the pastors here. I'm not sure this really happened, but one of the men told me this really happened. And I hope it happened. It's such a good story. It'd be a pity for it not to have happened. <laughs> At least I can say he said it, and I'm not the liar he is, if it's not true. We went out soul winning every morning, and one man came back and said, uh, Let me tell you what happened to me. I said, What is it? He said, I was out soul winning. This car was stopped on the side of the road. And he said, I stopped to help the lady. He said, I said, pull the hood. She pulled the hood. He said, I checked everything under the hood. Couldn't find a thing wrong with the automobile. So I walked up to the door and said, lady, I can't find a thing wrong with this car. Slide over and let me see if I can crank it. He said, she slid over and I turned the key. Zzz, 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 zzz. Thing wouldn't crank. I looked down. It's out of gas. I said, lady, not a thing wrong with this car except it's out of gas. She said, would it hurt it to drive it on home like this? <laughs> I'd hate to drive through this sermon out of gas, I'd... but I'm out of gas. When I stay up late, I get silly. What's your excuse? I was preaching recently, and a man got in the pulpit after I got through. He said, well, I'm serious myself. I'm not like Dr. Hudson. I'm serious in the pulpit. After the service, I nudged him. I said, don't confuse seriousness with solemnity. A man can be serious without being solemn. The Lord wasn't always solemn, but he was always serious. There's a funny thing he said when he said, you strain the that and swallow a camel. If you could get the mental picture, you'd be laughing now. The guy putting the cloth over a glass of water, straining that out, and then a camel got in there with two humps on his back, and he drank him down. That's funny. <laughs> to be serious doesn't mean you have to have a long face, so long it take four dollars to get you a shave. Look like you've been weaned on dill pickle juice and had wine for Simmons for breakfast. You know you can smile. Thank you. That's about all laughing you'll do. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and following. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote, tiny little speck, that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam, two before, that is in thine own eye, Hudson translation. Or how will thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast the beam out of thine own eye, and then shall thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again, and rend you. And now let us bow our heads for prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, I have some strong temptations as I stand here. There are so many things I'd like to share with this group of preachers. I confess I do not know the most important thing I could say to them. I feel that what I'm about to say is probably one of the important things. I've opened the Bible to this text, and I'm preaching here this morning. I pray the Holy Spirit would absolutely control me. Tell me to thank my thoughts after thee and to say this morning exactly what I ought to say and to say it in the way it ought to be said. <clears throat> Tell me to be a blessing to this congregation. My body is tired. My voice is thin. I wish today that I had the vocabulary of angels. 
I wish I had the oratorical ability of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I think I know right now how Charles, John, uh, Charles Whit, uh, George Whitfield must have felt when he prayed and said, Dear Lord, someday I'll be like thee. And if I'm to be like thee someday, why not now when I can be a blessing to the most people? And Jesus, I'd sure like to have my glorified body this morning, have my mind as clear, as clear as your mind, have the feeling towards these preachers in this congregation that you have when you look at them. The best I know how I yield that you may control me. Let me feel as much of that as I can and help the folk to listen. Old truths they may know very well, but perhaps they need to be rehearsed simply and practically this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak this morning on the right and wrong kind of criticism. There's actually three kinds of criticism in this passage that I read. Verse 1, judge not that you be not judged, is what I'd classify as destructive criticism, the cynic critic that's always trying to find something wrong with somebody else, just looking for something wrong. Verse 4 is what I call deluded criticism. Here a Christian brother is trying to get a moat out of his brother's eye while he at the same time has a beam in his own eye. And according to the words of Jesus, he cannot see clearly to get the moat out of his brother's eye. He's deluded. He can't see good. It's all right to help your brother, but you don't want to knock his head off with the two before hanging out of your eye while you're trying to get a speck out of his eye. Verse 6, I call that discriminating criticism. Give not that which is holy under the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Sometimes if you take any kind of a stand against anybody for anything, someone will rise up and say, Be not judged not that you be not judged. They use verse 1 and try to keep it from taking any kind of a separated stand, even from modernism some kind, sometimes and liberalism. Verse 1 is not saying don't make any kind of a judgment, because verse 6 requires that you do make at least four judgments. If you give not that which is holy unto the dogs, you've got to judge what is holy, and you've got to judge who is the dog. If you do not tra- cast your pearls before swine, you've got to make a judgment as to what is a pearl and what is a swine. So you have to make four judgments there. I call that discriminating criticism. That is the right kind of criticism. Second Corinthians 6.14 says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 1 John chapter 4 says, Beloved, try the spirits to see whether they be of God. I have a command in the Bible not to yoke up with an unbeliever. So I have a right to make some kind of a judgment about a man concerning the fundamentals of the faith. Now, I want to say I'm a fundamentalist. I make absolutely no apologies for it. I'm a fundamentalist. I want to tell you also that for many years I had no idea what modernism was. The first copy of the sword of the Lord I saw, I, I read that little heading, we oppose modernism, liberalism, formalism, and worldliness, and I thought, this man believes like I do. He's against modernism. The only difference is, I thought modernism was having inside bathrooms in the church. <laughs> I thought modernism was giving the preacher a salary. I thought modernism was going to Bible college to learn how to preach. I thought modernism was having padded pews and carpeted aisles and, and special singing in the church. I thought everybody was supposed to sing at one time, all together, off key. And we always succeeded. I had no idea what modernism was. I didn't know modernism was a matter of belief. When I first heard the word fundamentalist, I thought of fundamentalist as somebody who scream loud. Some of them do scream loud. But there's a lot of wild bears that scream loud. And all my four kids screamed loud long before they knew what a fundamentalist was. And if screaming loud was a fundamentalist, a lot of folks would be a fundamentalist. Fundamentalist is a matter of believing the fundamentals of the faith. And a fundamental is a cardinal doctrine. It's an essential truth. It's something you cannot deny and still have Christianity. I'll, alliter- I'll give them to you real quickly, and I won't preach on them, just very simply. The virgin birth of Christ is a fundamental of the faith. 
that Jesus Christ is not the virgin-born Son of God, I say it reverently, but we don't have a Savior. If he was born like we were born, he inherited the sin nature I inherited from my parents, and they got from their parents, and they got from their parents all the way back to Adam, the first man. So the Bible says in Romans 5, 12, as by one man sin entered into the world or into mankind. Romans 5, 19, by one they were made sinners. If Jesus Christ is an offspring of man and not of God, then he inherited the same sin nature I inherited when I was born. And he owes the same sin debt I owe, and we do not have a sinless substitute to die in our place. And I say it reverently, we'll all go to hell, and Jesus Christ will go with us if he's not the virgin-born Son of God. So the virgin birth is not something you can take or leave. It is an essential. It's a fundamental. I have a Buick automobile, a 1976 Buick automobile. Everything in that automobile is not fundamental. The spare tire is not a fundamental. I can drive it without the spare tire. The stereo radio is not a fundamental. I enjoy it, but I can drive it without the stereo radio. The back seat's not a fundamental. The air condition's not a fundamental. But gasoline's a fundamental. It won't run without gasoline. The motor is a fundamental. You take the motor out, you may as well have a kitty car or a tricycle or a skateboard. You'll get a lot further on it because you've done away with the things that makes the car operate. Now, let's be honest. We don't all agree on everything with anybody we, we know anywhere in the world. There's not anybody here that agrees with me on everything that I believe, including myself. I don't agree with me. <laughs> I've got sermons I preached eight years ago, and if I'd kill you before I'd let you play them on a tape recorder. I'd kill you in Christian love and tell God you died with the smallpox, but I'd kill you. <laughs> I've read in Spurgeon's sermon books in the introduction where he said, you'll notice in this volume that in such and such a sermon, I contradict what I said in, a, in a, a late, another earlier volume on such and such a sermon. But he said, if a man is learning and writing as he's learning, it stands to reason that after a while... He'll learn more than he knew, and he'll, he'll learn something he didn't know back then. He will contradict himself. But he called attention to it because he wanted to be an honest man. And so we're learning. I hope we're learning. Occasionally I have a preacher say to me, Well, bless God, I'm the same I was 37 years ago. I hadn't changed a bit. And I feel like said, <laughs> A guy that hadn't read anything grown in 37 years is a spiritual retard. Well, I've learned a lot. Man, when I was coming up, my preacher preached there's no resurrection from the dead. And for years, I didn't believe there'd be a resurrection until I read the Bible. And John 5, 28 and 29 said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. There will be a resurrection. Yeah. Acts 24, 15 said there'll be a resurrection both of the just and of the unjust. And now I believe in a resurrection, and I've requested to be buried next to my old pastor. On the resurrection morning, I want to say, what do you think about this? <laughs> For years, I didn't believe in the second coming of Christ. I never heard a sermon on the second coming of Christ. First time I heard the word premillennial, a man came to my church. Had a little handful of people, about 12 or 15 people. And a man came to my church and brought a Bible in his hand. The only guy that ever came to church and brought a Bible with him. And he scared me. I thought he was a spy coming to check me out. It just so happened that Sunday night I was preaching my first seven-point sermon. I never had pointed my sermons before. And I'd read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Blessed is he that overcometh, I'll give him a white stone on that stone, I'll write a new name. Blessed is he that overcometh, I'll give him to eat of the hidden manner. And that night I said, I'm preaching tonight on God's promises to the overcomers. And I had a time, I didn't know what it meant, but I had a good time. I said, firstly, never had done that before. I was getting good at this preaching business. I had seven points in a poem. It was good. <laughs> Firstly, him that overcometh, I'll give him a white stone on that stone. I'll write a new name, and no man will know it except he that received it, and he that gave it. And I waxed eloquent priest on the white stone. I had no idea what it meant. I said, hallelujah, it's the white stone. Got my name on it. Nobody can steal it. Glory to God. And I preached around. <laughs> God, all I get out of the white stone, I said, secondly... 
him that overcometh, I'll give to eat of a hidden manner. I said, bless God, I don't know what manner of manner it is. <laughs> but if it lasts till I get there, it must be good. They don't mildew or spoil till I get there. And it's hidden and the devil can't find it. Glory to God, and I feast on the manor till everybody got hungry for manor. <laughs> and I came to the last promise and ran into a stump. Revelation 3, 21, and I said, and finally... Him that overcome is that I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down on my father on his throne. In the middle of my sermon, I didn't know what it meant. And I said to myself, Self, what are you going to tell him about that verse? I said, I'm going to tell him what he said. And I looked out to my congregation and said, According to this verse, Jesus is not on his throne. But someday he'll sit on his throne and we'll sit with him on his throne, just like he is now seated with the father on the father's throne. And that guy that had that Bible on the back said, Amen! And I said, You said something good. <laughs> if you just knew what it was. <laughs> and then I thought, If I say it again, I might catch it this time. <laughs> so I got a little louder and a little faster, and I said, Bless God, according to this verse, Jesus is not on his throne. Hallelujah, someday he'll reign on his throne and we'll reign with him. The man said, Amen! I said, there's something good in that verse if I can find it. <laughs> that guy's found it. I said it eight times that he was embarrassed to say Amen anymore. <laughs> and I concluded my sermon. He came to me after the service and said, God bless you, boy. I didn't know you was a premillennial preacher. And I said, we're glad you came to church. I hope you'll come back. <laughs> Well, I said, if I knew you was premillennial, I'd have joined this church and helped you. I said, come back and see us. <laughs> he wouldn't leave. He said, you are premillennial, aren't you? I dropped my head. I said, sir, I'm so embarrassed. I never heard that premillennial. What is that? <laughs> he said, you're not postmillennial, are you? I said, that's another word I never heard. He said, well, you're not all millennial. I said, I never heard any millennium words. He said, boy, you believe what you preach? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're a premillennial preacher and don't know it. <laughs> well, I didn't know where to kiss him or hit him. I didn't know where it was good or bad. <laughs> Scared me to death. I was so embarrassed. It so happened in my ordination, 99 all millennial preachers gave me a Schofield Bible. <laughs> and the guy presented me with the Bible, shook it in my face and said, Kirk, don't you tell him Jesus is coming back and reign a thousand years. You preach what's in this book. <laughs> gave me a scope for your Bible. <laughs> and for years I thought I had the wrong Bible, had all these half pages down here. It wasn't the Bible, all these little letters and numbers. I thought I had a bad Bible for years. I reached up and took my little scope for your Bible off the pulpit. I'd never read the subject index. Didn't know how to use my concordance. Been preaching six years, trying to. Couldn't call it preaching. I started to walk off and he saw my Bible. He spotted, you know how people are, uh, Scofield Bible people, you know, that's the kind Jesus has got. <laughs> you know, we pray and tell Lord what page to find in this Scofield Bible. <laughs> he said, boy, let me see your Bible. I said, my, my, oh Lord. He's done embarrassed about this premillennial stuff, now he wants to expose my Bible. And I said, I knew it's been a bad Bible all these years, I should have thrown it away and got another. He said, let me see your Bible. Boy, I said, it's... Just a Bible, I'm curious. <laughs> he said, I won't steal your sermon notes. I knew he wouldn't. <laughs> Finally, he took my Bible, pulled it out of my hand, just pulled it out of my hand. I said, oh, me. He looked on the back and said, Schofield Reference Edition. Huh. And you told me you didn't know what a premillennial preacher was. And he laughed. He said, how long you had this Bible? I said, six years. They gave him ordination. You've been preaching out of that six years? Yeah. You almost made me believe you didn't know what a premillennial was. And my mind was doing flip-flops, <laughs> trying to figure out what a premillennial preacher had to do with this Bible. I was so dumb, I didn't know what the fundamentals was. I didn't know nothing. Our churches believe what is to be, will be, and if it don't happen. The test of fellowship in our churches was not, do you believe in the fundamentals, but so help me, the test of fellowship in our churches was, do you wash feet? And they had fellowship with you if you denied the virgin birth, as long as you washed feet. 
You got quite a bunch of feet washes here, I guess. Never know what you're preaching to. By the way, I'm not against feet washing. I think everybody ought to wash your feet once a week. If you don't, when you put old eaters in your shoes, you'll disappear. <laughs> I lost two brothers that way. I told you when I'm sleepy, I get silly. Watch it. Man, we believe what is to be will be. Two of our churches split over a chicken leg. It was on August. They was having a homecoming, dinner on the ground, feet washing. They had it once a year. Followed by revival. That's the only time you could get saved. You're not revival. If you didn't get saved, you had to wait till next year. And one of those predestinarians got out there and picked up a big fat chicken leg and looked at his watch and said it was predestined before the foundation of the world that I should eat this chicken leg on August the 23rd at 3.22 p.m. in the afternoon. Another guy didn't believe in predestination quite so strong, reached over and grabbed it out of his hand and said, it ain't going to be so this time, and he ate it. <laughs> and the church is split over a chicken leg. I never have met a guy believe in predestination who thought he was predestined for hell. It's always the other fellow's lost, he's saved. And I never met a non-elected Calvinist. Put that in the hopper and sift it out for yourself. I don't have time to stop. I, I got four more points for I can tell you what the right kind of criticism is, and then I got a bunch of points on this last point. I didn't know what the fundamentals were. I was dumb. I had to learn for myself. Virgin bursts the fundamental. You deny that, you may as well close your church, spit on the Bible, and go home. You don't have nothing. The physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the fundamental. A fellow denies that, can't be saved. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that God is raised and from the dead, thou shall be saved. That's the fundamental. I have some things I'd die for, some things I'd fight for that I wouldn't die for, and some things I'd fuss about that I wouldn't fight about. When it comes to the spiritual realm, I'd die for the fundamentals of faith. I'd chase a fellow all the way across Kentucky, beating him with a shovel that denied the virgin birth and the blood atonement. I'd do it in Christian love, but I'd beat, beat him. I'd kiss him at once while and hit him again. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. I'll hit a modernist! Dirty, low-down coward on the wolf in sheep's clothing, taking money under false pretense. You ought to try and put him in jail. Yeah. I'm fundamentalist. Yeah, you deny the virgin birth, but it, uh, the blood atonement of the resurrection of Jesus. You can't go to heaven. Physical resurrection, the blood atonement, Jesus died for sinners. I can't develop all this. I must hurry. You deny that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners. You've denied a fundamental then. If he didn't die for sinners, we're all going to hell. May as well close shop. If you preach works for salvation or some other way to get to heaven, buddy, the dirtiest gang of thieves this side of hell are religious thieves who are trying to climb up to heaven some other way other than the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the Word of God. That's the fundamental of the faith doesn't contain the Word of God, it is the Word of God. I said that one time to a guy, and he said, well, all the Bible's not the Word of God. I said, how come it's not? He said, because it's not. I said, what part's not God's Word? And he turned to Genesis. And he read, where the devil said to Eve, thou shalt not surely die. He said, that's not God's Word, that's the devil's Word. I said, that's God's Word. That's God saying, the devil said to Eve, thou shalt not surely die. It's God telling on the devil. But God said it, Amen. We wouldn't know the devil said it if God hadn't told us he said it. Amen. The Bible's the Word of God. Amen. From Genesis to Revelation. I believe every word of it. Don't have any doubt about any of it. The Holy Bible must have been inspired of God and not of men. I would not if I could believe that good men wrote it to deceive. And bad men would not if they could proceed to write a book so good. And no crazy man could ever conceive its wondrous plan. So pray what other kind of men than do these three groups comprehend. So it must be that God inspired the words that souls of prophets fired. The Bible's God's Word. The virgin birth of Jesus, his vicarious surfings, his victorious resurrection, verbal inspiration of the Bible, for sake of alliteration, and the coming of Jesus Christ, 
is the fundamental of the faith. Now, we may disagree on, the, on how many specials you ought to have for your saying. We may disagree on when you ought to receive the offering. We may disagree on whether or not to have a bus or to have a bus. But we ought to agree to disagree on the non-essentials and still love each other. We are God's army. We can shake the world for God if we don't kill each other. Most fundamentalists remind me of the guy who met a friend and said, How's your wife? He said, Didn't you hear she died? Well, he said, I'm sorry to hear it. How did it happen? He said, she ate some poison mushrooms. Well, he said, I'm very sorry. He said, well, I married again. Well, he said, how's your second wife? I said, she died too. Well, he said, I'm sorry. How did she die? He said, she had a brain concussion. Well, he said, how did it happen? He said, she wouldn't eat her mushrooms. <laughs> you know, we'll do an awful lot if we don't kill each other in the process. Everybody gets a little pet thing to preach about. Man, if you believe in the fundamentals of the faith, I'm for you. Well, you promote or don't promote, suit yourself. Man, I was at a church yesterday. Roger Vogelin had 5,230... What, yesterday? Is before? Yes, I lost today in traveling. It was Sunday. Had 5,237 there. We had over 500 conversions there Sunday morning. I'm forgetting all you can get in. But if you're not for it and still believe in the fundamentals, I'd fellowship with you. I'd pray for it. You get enlightened on some things, but I'd fellowship with you. Yeah. yeah. You believe in the virgin birth, the vicarious sufferings of Jesus Christ, his victorious resurrection, verbal inspiration of the Bible, the Bible's the word of God from beginning to end. Jesus Christ is coming again. All right, then. Put it there, buddy. I'll shake hands with you. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said, if a hound dog came through town barking for Jesus, I'd throw him a bone. I'm kind of glad in a way I didn't go to anybody's school. <laughs> I'm introduced as Dr. Hudson, but God knows I never finished high school. I do have a high school diploma, but only God now knows how I got it. <laughs> and it ain't none of your business. They call me Dr. Hudson. My first doctorate was a doctor of divinity. I thought it qualified me to make candy when I got it. Dr. Hiles gave me a doctor of humanities, abbreviated H-U-M, period D, and I thought it stood for humdinger when I saw it. <laughs> I have two doctors agree. I'm an official paradox. Ah, uh, that'll slip up on you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm kind of glad. You know, if we're not careful, we'll put our loyalty to some fellowship or some church or, or, I mean, some school or some movement or some group. Our loyalty ought to be to Jesus Christ. I'm a Baptist, Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead, but I, oh, I love all fundamentalists. I really think John Wesley will be in heaven. If he's there with his robe on, I'm going to try to get it tangled up around his legs and baptize him in the river of life. <laughs> but I think he probably made it. Uncle Buddy Robertson, the tongue-tied Nazarene, was saved under a Methodist preacher's preaching and got what he called the second blessing under a sanctified second blessing Presbyterian preacher and died a Nazarene. Kind of mixed up, but I think Uncle Bud made it. I sure hope so. I want to see him. Uncle Bud went across the country preaching on the second blessing, second blessing, and he preached the good sermon. I heard it on the tape. I don't even believe in the second blessing. I had to work to keep him bleeding after I heard Bud preach it. <laughs> Bud said, the Lord touched that man. It was blind and said, what do you see? And the man said, I see men walking like tweezed. Uncle Buddy said, he needed the second blessing. <laughs> and he touched him the second time, second blessing. He said, now what do you see? And said, the man said, I see all men clearly. Uncle Buddy said, when I just had the first blessing, that I saw the denominational boss is like big old tweeze. But when I got the second blessing, I saw all men clearly. <laughs> I said, Bud, I don't believe it, but the way you preach it, I want it. He preached on the second blessing so much. One guy said, Buddy, you preach the second blessing. I've had thousands of blessings. But he said, if you had that many, you wouldn't care if old Buddy had two, would you? <laughs> I 
I'm getting blessed by my own preaching. Right? <laughs> if I wasn't so dignified, I'd have an old-fashioned Nazarene Baptist Pentecostal slobbering, running, fit, and talking hillbilly. Thirty-three minutes. <laughs> Wouldn't be difficult. That's my native tongue. <laughs> old Uncle Bud went to see a doctor, and he couldn't hear a word out of one ear. And he said, Doctor, I can't hear I did the ear. The doc gave him an examination and said, Uncle Buddy, it's not a thing in the world but old age. He said, I declare I don't understand it. He said, I can't hear a word out of this ear, and I hear perfectly clear out of this ear, and you say it's old age, and both ears are born at the same time. <laughs> he better be in heaven. I want to see him. <laughs> I'm Baptist, yeah. I'm going to die Baptist. I think maybe Martin Luther might make it in, justified by faith. Amen. He brought too much out of the Catholic Church with him, and so did John Calvin, to suit me. Amen. So I'm Baptist. Now I think a rooster who won't crow in his own barn, you ought to wring his neck and make chicken and dumplings out of him. <laughs> I'm Baptist! But I'm a fundamentalist and a Christian first. Just having a good time. Amen. Yeah. All right, if a guy denies the fundamentals of the faith, what are you going to do about it? Second Corinthians six fourteen says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I personally will not knowingly be yoked up with anybody who denies one of the fundamentals of the faith. But if a guy loves the Lord and is mixed up on some doctrines and maybe hadn't learned, what if the people had treated me that way I, when I didn't believe in the second coming? You would have called me an apostate. I wasn't an apostate. I was ignorant. I'd have called you an apostate. You drew a salary. <laughs> you was a hireling. That's what you were. And while you call me an apostate, I'm calling you an apostate, and the apostate's laughing at both of us. <laughs> Amen? We believe in the fundamentals of faith. Good night. Let's don't be divisive over every little thing that comes along. I'm going to fellowship with you. You may not like me. I'm going to like you anyhow. I'm going to pray for you. That's the right kind of criticism. Separate from unbelievers and modernism and apostasy and liberalism. But here's the wrong kind. Back here in verse 4. How will you say to your brother, let me pull the moat out of thy eye and the beans in your own eye? Now here's two brothers. And God called one of them a hypocrite. Here's a brother going around with a two before hanging out the side of his head about that long. He said, brother, let me help you get that speck out of your eye. That's funny. Now, I want to ask you in the first place, why did he see a speck in his brother's eye? I've been here all morning. I haven't seen a speck in anybody's eye. If you see a speck in somebody's eye, you've got to be looking for it. It is not glaring. It does not demand attention. He had to be walking up real close and pick, pull his eye out and say, let me see that, brother. Honey, hold a flashlight here. Son, have my magnifying glass. Huh? You know that somebody just look for something wrong, look for something wrong, look for something wrong? If you look for something wrong, you'll find it. Because there's nobody perfect. Amen. I've had folks come to the church. We had hundreds saved, scores baptized. And somebody found some little something wrong that maybe one usher didn't come quite down for it, missed an aisle or done something. Maybe somebody didn't speak to them. They missed all the conversions, the wonderful choir music, all the baptism, and made a big issue over some little something didn't mind to the hill of beans. We go to meetings like this and, and had great preaching. With the exception of this morning, my part, you have great preaching and you go out here trying to find a little old something wrong. You know why he saw the speck? He's looking for it. I'm going to tell you one thing. That's one, th that's one reason I'd never run for political office. I'm afraid for them to go to search in my life. And I hope that doesn't encourage any of y'all. There's a lot back there I don't want nobody to know about. Don't say amen. You don't know what's back in my life. What you mean is something back in your dirty life. What you mean? <laughs> Come speck hunting! You know why he found a speck? He's looking for it. You see what you're looking for. Remember that old poem, Pussycat, Pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the Queen. Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you there? I spied a little mouse under a chair. My ring a ding ling. There's Westminster Abbey with its sainted dead, the London Tower, and old Big Ben. The palace, the queen, 
The cat went over there. What do you see? A rat. <laughs> you know why? He's looking for a rat. If you want to get a good report on the landscape, don't send a buzzard out. <laughs> He'll fly over the landscape, see beautiful placid lakes and flowering trees, lush green meadows, fleecy blue skies and little clouds puffing along. Many wonderful, beautiful sights. And when he gets back, you say, what did you see? He'll say, I saw a dead cow with maggots all in it. <laughs> when he says that, he just exposes his nature. He's a buzzard. I met a few of them. Several of them are members of my church. He's looking for something wrong. Looking, looking, looking! And he found it! And you look for something wrong, you'll find it! I don't want to call anything by name, because if I did, I'd make some of you angry. No way to speak on things by name, but I hit somebody in the congregation with something. But if you agree on the fundamentals of faith, you're my brother. I'll pray for you. I hope you'll pray for me. And I won't be going around with a magnifying glass trying to find something a little wrong with you. It doesn't have nothing to do with fund fundamentals whatsoever. You see what you're looking for. I'm gone over time. I've got to stop. There are several reasons. Let me throw it at you. First, we want to find something wrong with somebody else because we're jealous. We're envious. We just don't want him to be having that many conversions. They can't all be saved. Nobody ever questioned my converts when I had three a year. When we started having 85 and 90 a Sunday, they began to say, I wonder how many are really saved. Same ones that were saved when they were getting three a year. In fact, we had more genuine conversions after we had 80-something. Because when we only had three a year, we prayed them through. We didn't take the Bible to them how to get saved. We prayed them through. We'd get them down to hold them at the altar and pray. Lord, save him! Oh, God, save him! Save him! And a lot of them got saved to get up. <laughs> One old lady came forward with a dip of snuff in her mouth. She said, I won't get saved. He said, bow down here, we'll pray you through. She got down and they prayed a long time. She got tired and got up and went and sat on the front pew and left the preacher praying by himself. He finally finished. When he finished, he looked around and she sat on the front pew. He said, Sister, did you pray? She said, Yes, I sure did. Did you ask the Lord to save? He said, Yes, I sure did. What well, he said, Sister, what did the Lord say? She said, he said, okie dokie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure God looked over the battlements of the heaven and spoke in Hebrew and said, okie dokie. <laughs> she wasn't saved. She didn't know what the basis of assurance was. She thought the basis of assurance was God saying, okie dokie. Didn't know nothing about the written word. The guy who would win souls and win many of them must run the risk of criticism by the man who will do nothing. Jealousy digs the mud that envy throws its success. We criticize the other guy because we're jealous. And then we think we can build our own ministry by tearing his down, but no man ever built his house by destroying another man's house. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and tell you why we find fault. And when we start finding fault with the other guys because we're blinded, this man here, Jesus said, your problem is you can't see. You, you've gone to looking for so much in everybody else that you're blinded to your own condition. And your condition is 10,000 times worse than the guy with the speck. You've got a beam in your eye. We ought to be experts at finding the mote in our eye. Instead of experts, um, the beam in our eye, instead of being experts at finding the mote in the brother's eye. Okay, you don't agree with me on everything. Some folks say you holler too loud. Some folks say you don't holler loud enough. Some folks say you're too funny. Some folks say you preach too long. Some folks say you spit on the first eight rows. And I do. When I only had six rows, I spit on the back wall. <laughs> but can't you find something good with a guy if he believes in the fundamentals of the faith? My boy brought an old dog home one day. He was just a little bit, my boy's red-headed, cute little old guy. Looks like me. <laughs> Bought a dog home. It looked like it had been all over a car. Had axle grease all over it, skin in two or three places. Pus in the wounds. Fleas all over him, eat up. Couldn't hardly walk, he'd fall. 
He looked diseased. My boy's patting him. I said, son, get away from that dog. It's terrible. Get away from that dog. He said, daddy, I want this dog. I said, you can't have that dog. He said, I want that dog. I said, son, look at him. He's all got sores all over him. He's got fleas all over him. And his ears got mat, mat, matted all up. He said, but daddy, he wagged his tail. Well, if you don't like nothing else about me, I wag my tail. <laughs>